Hey, everybody. Um, today we're interviewing Dr. Alan Hobson, an American psychiatrist and dream researcher. He's well known for his pioneering research on REM sleep. He's the Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School back in the 70s. He, uh, with Robert McCarley, came up with the reciprocal interaction theory of REM neurobiology. In the 1980s, he argued, he argued that dreams were the result of activation and synthesis of impulses origin, originating in the brainstem. In the 1990s and 2000s, he unified all this work and ideas in his AIM theory, AIM, activation, integration, modulation. And more recently, he's been working with the renowned neuroscientist Paul Kristen and um, asking fundamental questions about REM neurobiology and consciousness. So we're very, very honored and happy to be speaking with him today. Without further ado, Dr. Hobson. And thank you for being here. So yes. I mean, one thing um, that uh, Michelle and I have been talking about that we'd love to get your perspectives on Yes. It's some of the history of uh, the field of dream science, including some of the famous characters in dream science. We'd, first, first of all, we want to talk to you about um, your recent work, your theories, your work with Friston, and your theories of uh, proto-consciousness and the relationship of dreams and consciousness. But we'd love to start with getting some of your takes on the history of the field and some of the characters some okay. of the great scientists who pioneered the field. Like, okay. did you ever meet Kleitman and Asarinsky? Oh, sure. What, yeah, what was your impression of them? Well, Kleitman was an old school physiologist uh, who came to psychology, you know, by the force of things. He was really a, a physiologist uh, trained in Germany and the books that he wrote, uh, are, are classic, but they're not psychological at all. Yeah. And when he, he recruited Azarinsky um, as a, uh, um, a, doc, a doctoral fellow, and he gave Azarinsky the, the project of uh, re recording uh, sleep and, and dreams in, in, in the young. And uh, of course, Azarinsky really was interested in something entirely different. He was interested in attention. And so he yeah. used the uh, Kleidman uh, patronage to set up these studies of attention in the young. And of course, the young uh, couldn't pay attention. They went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and so he discovered REM sleep by accident. He noticed the eyes moving. Yeah, he 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 uh, uh, did. He had the sense of doing uh, EOG recordings mm -hmm. because the tension was mm -hmm. clearly related to eye movement, and so he was interested in eye movement as a, as a signal of attention. And of course, these subjects didn't pay attention, and they had eye movement, so there was <laughs> something wrong. And the physiology was then, I think, very clear because he also had re was recording uh, EOG. Uh, at that at that point, they didn't realize the uh, importance of muscle mm. uh, relaxation, so they didn't record EMG. But these little subjects, which included his son, by the way, it's a very huh. important historical. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, his son has written extensively about this experience, and he might be somebody who hmm. would talk to you. Uh, huh. I don't know that for a fact, but huh. he, uh, he, he was very, very uh, antagonistic to his father. And, really? Uh, <laughs> I wonder well, why. Well, Because he was made a subject of research or something? A guinea pig? He said that... Um, he said... Um, no, I shouldn't. I can't remember the quote exactly about being a sport. Don't be a sport, and uh, uh, 
young young Azarinsky thought, well, I am a sport, you know. I, that's exactly what I am. And, <laughs> and so th th there's a lot of interesting detail. How about William DeMent? What's your... Well, DeMent came in uh, when Azarinsky cleared off, you see. Azarinsky was not interested in dreaming at all. He was interested in uh, uh, physiology of the brain, and uh, he didn't... He didn't realize, and this is a point that I want to emphasize with you guys, he didn't realize that uh, the mind-body problem, the Cartesian di dialectic, was, was the enemy. He thought he was a physiologist, therefore he was not a psychologist. I say that if you're going to be a psychologist with respect to dreams, you have at least to know about physiology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was clear in the Azarinsky Gleitman discovery and publication in 1953 that the brain and the mind were a unified system. And these guys were still trying to keep them apart. Physiology is physiology. Psychology is psychology. Mm. Neither of us is either. And so enter Bill DeMent. That's, that's the long-winded an answer to your question. Huh? DeMent was a psychiatrist like me, I think, uh, felt that um, psychiatry was uh, in, a, in, a, in a very perilous anti-scientific state since Sigmund Freud, although I think DeMent was more sympathetic to Freud than I was. So, um, in, in essence, DeMent then stepped in where Azarinsky and Kleitman bowed out. And DeMent really put the REM sleep discovery and its relation to dreaming on the map. Yes. So those papers which DeMent authored in 55, 57, that's really the beginning of the, the history of uh, the psychophysiology of dreaming. Agreed. How about Michel Jouvet? Jouvet, sorry. Jouvet, well, Jouvet was a... Uh, a French neurosurgeon, and he uh, uh, was unhappy with uh, the state of French science. So he went to UCLA to study with uh, Horace Magoon. And uh -huh. it was when he was at UCLA that he became aware of the discovery, of uh, Dement's discovery. And Dement and uh, Jouvet became very, very close friends and work very closely together. And that's probably not generally known or appreciated. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, they really put the, the field on the map, as it were, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jouvet uh, was a neurosurgeon who came into <laughs> dream research via, via the uh, uh, UCLA uh, Association. Mm -hmm. So what, what that means is that if you're young and you're in a field, you should travel and go to another place and you should <laughs> study with somebody else whose, whose interests don't at first seem relevant to yours. And I, I think that's a very important point. And one of the big obstacles to the field is that people keep repeating themselves and each other. They don't cross fertilize. And, uh, yeah. You get a lot of new, novel, innovative insights with cross fertilization. It's all bullshit. It's, uh, frankly, one article after another that says the same thing as the previous. Yeah. yeah. So to have a really radical uh, position and a new position, uh, you've, you've you've got to change your mind. Yeah. Be challenged by other fields, other mm -hmm. insights. Yeah. Well, what whatever whatever field you're in. Is is closeted by its assumptions, and uh, you know. Good way to put it, yeah. Most of the assumptions are are uh, probably wrong, certainly inadequate, and the assumptions that may be relevant are not at all apparently relevant. And so, hmm. what you have to be sure of it, if you're a young researcher is that whatever you're being told is just theory and you know it's, it's arbitrary and it's probably wrong and i think that's a very important point that science is just 
a set of hypotheses. Mm. It, it is always changing. And the hypotheses are never, ever facts, really. Facts exist. REM sleep exists. Dreaming exists. These are facts. The physiology of REM sleep exists. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. the, the psychology of dreaming exists. It's a theory. <laughs> the question is, how do you shape the theory to fit the facts? Or how do you use the facts to construct the theory? And, and the latter is what I did. And uh, I think, uh, you know, for better or worse, <laughs> it's been very interesting. Because uh -huh. nobody... Sorry. No, nobody believes a word that I say. You see, you know. <laughs> I, I, would, I wouldn't put it that way. I, I think, don't think, so. I well, think you've I, I, I dramatically think influenced everybody in, in the field. Yes, however, that's not, that's not what I want. A celebration is, is welcome. I, 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 <laughs> I welcome the, the admiration of anybody. But uh, what I really want more than anything else is, is to convey a sense of understanding. Mm -hmm. That is to say that uh, the science of, of, of dreaming um, must include uh, at least a, a knowledge of physiology, if not physiology. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I think, I think you, you have to be a physiologist too. And nobody, yeah. nobody really wants to do that. They, they just want yeah. to get a PhD and in something and go out and have kids and get rich and, you know hey, that's perfectly that's normal. the dream <laughs> yeah, normal. we all do that how about alan rectus false and i can't pronounce his oh, last name oh, alan rechtschaffen certainly the yeah. most uh brilliant and insightful student of uh nathaniel Kleidman. uh he got his phd with Kleidman, and uh, very quickly teamed up with Dement and did a lot of uh, very important work together, including the classical work on narcolepsy. But more important than that for me, Rex Schaffen uh, was a genuine scientific intellectual. He realized that uh, uh, the theories that were out there were probably wrong. He started to uh, investigate dreaming and the physiology of dreaming um, in, in, in quite an admirable and uh, uncommitted way. He was in Jouvet's lab, for instance, when I was, when I was there. So I knew Alan very well, and Alan, Alan uh, was superb in intellect. For instance, the uh, single-mindedness of dreams. Yeah. That's his idea. That's his yeah. idea. He, he, well, it's obvious, isn't it? When you think about it, dreams but, are very single-minded. But, but to find that phrase to really express that yeah. aspect of dreaming was brilliant insight. Among other things. And he also realized <laughs> I think, that uh, the, uh, the, the answer to questions about why that was so had to be, had to include physiology. Mm-hmm. And so you, you couldn't just sit there and, and Freudianize the single-mindedness of dreams and get anywhere. Can, can you, for our audience, describe what that means, single-mindedness of dreams? Yes, well, when we're awake, we have uh, many, many uh, aspects to our consciousness. But when we're asleep and think we're awake, erroneously, we have a very limited um, experiential, I never say to myself, or rarely say to myself, I must be dreaming. This is so kooky. This is so wild. I mean, I, I'm, um, that lack of insight. I'm 87 years old. I've kept a, a dream journal for 50 years. I have uh, over a thousand, probably 2,000 accounts of dreams. They're all single minded, they're very, very rarely lucid. And that, that introduces another term that I think uh, Rechtschaffen deserves credit for. The fact that you do occasionally realize that you're dreaming. In other words, dreaming then, then becomes double-minded. It becomes insightful about itself. 
it's not just an existential and all totally encompassing phenomenon, which it normally is. And this is one of the reasons why um, I think your work is so important for the theory of consciousness in general. Yes, because once you start talking about this double consciousness, then you, then you wind up in the field of consciousness studies. Of course. Well, dreaming, dreaming was for a long time, I think, uh, the, the royal road, not to the unconscious, but to the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. yes. and that was not recognized. It's still not recognized. But your work That's is not... changing that. Mm, yeah, not as much as I'd hoped. <laughs> you see, you see people, if you follow the AI literature right now, yeah. or you follow the, the consciousness literature, dreamy is almost never mentioned. It's mentioned in passing. Yeah. But it's never mentioned as a uh, primary, a, a key to yeah. understanding yeah. the way the brain creates consciousness. And the way the brain creates consciousness is clearly related to the idea that the brain creates the conscious states. Waking on the one hand, yep. REM sleep on, yeah. on, on, on the other. Uh, and they're, they're very, they're both associated with intense uh, experiential awareness. Mm -hmm. But waking is double minded. I mean, you and I are mm -hmm. having this conversation now, and we've had a lot of other thoughts. And where is my daughter? Where is, you know, yeah. you know this right. stuff could go on. It doesn't interrupt our dialogue, but it, it plays around the edges. This doesn't happen in dreaming. I don't suddenly, uh, last night I was dreaming that, uh, you know, this uh, piece of my hand had become autonomous and had a mind of its own. <laughs> this is completely delusional and completely um, uh, unworthy of my scientific sophistication. <laughs> but I believed it and I woke up believing it. You know, my, so my dreams are totally compelling. What does that tell us about consciousness? The single-mindedness versus the double? Well, it tells us, I don't know what it tells us, but it tells us that it's important to have it. Nature that, put that, it there for some that, reason. That sound like a hand-waving uh, answer to the question, but it isn't. There is an important meaning, uh, reason for being single-minded. And I think the reason for being single-minded is related to the work with Friston. And, you know, we talk about that now or later. But uh, I think what's exciting to me now about my life is that I, I have all this wonderful uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, information to deal with. And I have a relationship with a person, Carl Friston, who wants to uh, create a theory of consciousness that is phys physical, physical and mathematical. And this is, yeah. may or may not be true, what he, what he wants to do, but it is true that every major scientific uh, uh, achievement that you can think of ultimately ends up being math mathematizable. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and being able to mathematize a theory is very important, and that's what Friston is doing. And Friston mm -hmm. is very nice to me, by the way. I, I just got a copy of the uh, the uh, paper that uh, I've submitted to the American Journal of Psychiatry called Minds, Brains, and uh, whatever, Minds, Brains, whatever. <laughs> anyway, it's a wonderful paper. Yeah, you shared that with me um, last week. Yes, I, I said I did send you a copy. And it's, it's very impressive. I, what I love about it is its attempt to relate all of that sophisticated uh, theory of consciousness in the predictive brain to um, neural disorders, neural psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that, that, that's true, and it does that very well. But it doesn't go far enough, in my opinion, in, in equating or making it clear that the power of the theory 
depends upon the physiology, which is not in dispute. I mean, now, but now 50 years on, there is no one who will get up and tell you that REM sleep doesn't exist unless it's the philosopher Malcolm. Yeah, uh, Norman Malcolm, yeah. It's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. You're just wrong. So yeah. bye, bye 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 Malcolm. You're wrong. Or Daniel Dennett, yeah. Or well, not. He, yeah, he's I, yeah, I he's less than yeah. Yeah, but I agree. still yeah, no, but yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Can we talk about lucid dreams for a few minutes and sure. maybe turn, turn since Michelle knows much more about this than me, let her. <laughs> yeah. The well, I don't know if we should we go through cuz you talk about lucid dreaming as being a possible um a way to test some of these theories that you're talking about. Do you I have any is, ideas about how it we is a way that? to test the theories? Do yes. you have any ideas of, of experiments that you would like to see conducted by lucid dreamers? Well, I think we've done a lot of it, but a lot more should be done. I think that uh, the uh, the capacity to uh, image the human brain um, enables you to study lucid dreaming. Uh, in subjects who are lucid dreamers while they are lucid dreaming. And we've done that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more of that should be done. Plus, I also think that now that we have a theory about what's going on in lucid dreaming, uh, which I'll be happy to describe to you, uh, yeah, we great. should go back to the drawing boards uh, in the animal uh, physiology range and, and find out what's going on. Uh, it's not to say that cats are going to be lucid dreamers, <laughs> but they probably have activation of their frontal lobes during REM sleep. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we, don't, we know nothing about that. And all of the uh, animal physiology is now off limits because of animal rights. And mm -hmm. Most of the work that I did is morally uh, not defensible. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to get into that one, but that, that is the real problem because animal science related to sleep and dreaming uh, probably can no longer use animals. Hmm. Yeah. So, so that's a historical roadblock and that will exist as long as people think that cats are people. <laughs> cats are not people. <laughs> and the fact that they're not people doesn't entitle you to do whatever you want with them, but uh, it, 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 it probably uh, contributes to that that sort of difficulty. So I think that the uh, the future of lucid dreaming is um, more studies of human subjects, and uh, Ursula Voss has uh, done done a really great job on that, and I wish she would do more. But she's decided to be a psychotherapist. So that's a dead end. Well, that's, mean, a, that's a problem with dream science. It's so hard to get funding in it, to, to do it. That's true. And, and uh, you know, again, I don't think that anything that we'll say on this podcast will help that situation. But I have uh, very brilliant students who can't get funding at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, another problem that, that is to say, there's a moral problem doing animal research, and yeah. there is a funding problem because everything now is molecular biology. Well, molecular biology could tie into the Friston Hobson story in an interesting way if somebody would do it. <laughs> you know, what, what postdoc where is going to do that? I don't know. Have them call me whenever they want to. <laughs> I'll supervise them by internet. No problem. Well, that's why I brought up before um, the 5-HT2A signaling yes. systems. No, no. But well, that's a no whole other conversation. Let's stay on uh, uh, yeah, it is lucid, a... lucid dreams for, for a few minutes. Okay. What else, Michelle, for on lucid? Well, I don't know. Could you just describe a bit maybe for our audience what you think is occurring when somebody becomes lucid and how that is a different... Yes, I, I, yeah, different sure. I, I think that, for example, last night when I was dreaming about my hand having 
autonomous consciousness, pan, a panpsychic idea, which I totally reject <laughs> when I'm awake. Um, I could have become lucid. I could have said, well, you're just dreaming. You know, what else is new? But I didn't do that. I didn't become lucid. So what I would predict is that when I don't become lucid, my REM sleep doesn't activate my frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. And when I do become lucid, the, 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 the frontal lobe is activated. And I think we already know the, the, the answer to that question will be yes. So, so the question is, what, what else is new? What else is new is to uh, find out what the subjects are thinking and, and, and do more with the available physiology, the human physiology. And this work, you know, was done by Ursula Voss's student, a Ferenc, um, friend, Frenzel. <laughs> he changed his name when he got married. He, met, he changed his, his name to his, his wife's family name, which is <laughs> extraordinary. So, but he's, he's in the Black Forest in a sleep clinic, and he can't get funding. You know, yeah. what they want him to do is to turn the crank and have a lot of subjects yeah. go through the clinic and increase their, in, their income. So, you know, I, I don't, that's a slightly rambling answer to your question, but... So I'm very another scared. question would be then if it, the fact that we don't become lucid, that we stay in this single mindedness. Yes. I think this is kind of functional for us and that, that relates yes. to our theory of. Oh, I think it's very important. Do you want I think it's very that? important. Yes. And, uh, and that, that, that ties into the Friston mm -hmm. uh, yeah. argument. But again, I, I'm not sure we've really done justice to the, to the, to the theme of lucid dreaming, but uh, I love to be lucid in my dreams, and it's very rare. Much more, it was very much more common when I was younger, so that's another problem. You, 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 lucid dreaming, why is it only uh, or ex almost exclusively associated with young, with youth? We have, we have no idea of, we think of sleep as, as, as unchanging but it changes dramatically over the life cycle. Oh yeah. And so uh, that, 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 that's an associated uh, theme uh, of uh, lucid dreaming, but lucid dreaming in old people, I, I hope you'll have people call up and say, yeah. you know, I'm 68 and I'm lucid every night. And now that's what we don't would come out of this kind of podcast. Good. But so lucid dreaming is, and, and the in the aim model, your famous um, well, activation integration <laughs> modulation model is a hybrid state between waking and sleep. Waking and REM sleep. Waking and, and REM it, sleep. It clearly is. I mean, lucid dreaming occurs uh, out of REM sleep, according to Laberge, and I think he's probably right about that. Mm -hmm. But again, that should be checked. It should be really, that should be really nailed down. Lucid mm -hmm. dreaming is always a REM sleep uh, migrant state or something like that. Mm -hmm. You have to have REM in place before you can be lucid. Then you put a little bit of waking back into the, the mix and you get lucid mm -hmm. dreaming. But this is a very exciting idea mm -hmm. that your, your brain mind is a cocktail. It's constantly being mixed and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and varies all over the place. I mean, I never had a dream like that when I had last night. Hmm. Yeah, they're like constantly creative, aren't they? Constantly yeah. turning up new stuff. Well, that's a nice way of putting it. Stuff we've never been exposed to before, you know? Of course. Of course. But that means they're really fundamentally creative. And yes. that's another fact that's not appreciated by mainstream cognitive neuroscience it seems to on me. the contrary dreaming is thought to be a a, a state of you know, you know flux or something epiphenomena they talk about waking all the time but they don't understand that waking is probably uh dependent upon REM sleep 
And that's another idea. That, that That's very interesting. Could you talk more about that? Because that, to me, is um, fundamental. Well, that gets us into Friston territory. And I think that uh, what I like about Friston is the, uh, the effort to create a theory that is uh, unified in the sense that uh, it considers the brain and mind to be a single system. And this, this is the, the basic problem, the basic scientific problem that we all face, du dualism. Mm -hmm. that, that there is the, the brain, and that's a physical substance, and there's the mind, and that's some, some other kind of substance, maybe. And what Friston and I are saying is that the brain and the mind are both physical systems, and they are interacting all the time. There is no way in which you could have a mental event independent of some physical event in the brain. It is possible to have physical events in the brain and nothing to show for it. We know that from non-REM mm -hmm. sleep, but, you know, again. Uh, so the uh, exciting thing about the theory is that uh, it tries to uh, unify mind and brain and say that mind is... Uh, is, is a brain function. It's just as physical as any other brain function. And that doesn't mean it isn't interesting, spiritual, or whatever you want to call it. That's why I, I think that to oppose the atheists on these matters is creating the mind. But he has to do it through the brain. He can't do it by magic, just by waving his fingers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The argument is, is very exciting. The, uh, the idea that uh, brain and mind are a unified system is what I think for instance. Um, how does, how does they, waking, if, if we got rid of REM somehow, maybe chemically with antidepressants or something, would... Yeah, well, you, no, you think... I have a guarded answer to that question. Okay. You don't do it with antidepressants. Because if you do it with antidepressants, you give back through the chemicals what you've tried to take away. In other words, you've suppressed REM sleep, but you've given back REM sleep function. Because the antidepressants uh, enhance the, uh, the amine uh, activators of, of the brain. Uh, which is essential uh, to uh, waking uh, and uh, equally essential to suppress them in order to dream. So if you give an antidepressant drug, you'll get REM suppression, but you won't get REM functional suppression. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the it, it's chemical. Mm -hmm. You've got the chemicals. This is what's exciting about our field now. We have the chemicals. Hmm. We know that they, these are true, and we know that these are true in, in, because, in fact, the physiology, you know, which is indisputable, I think. Now, now the work that McCarley and I did in, in the early, uh, in the 60s and 70s, is now classical. Nobody, nobody quarrels about that anymore. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't cite it either because they don't understand it. <laughs> So well, that's why I'm I'm, I'm slightly uh, disappointed, but, uh, but so, still the ar the argument is clear. So so well, waking waking consciousness depends on REM sleep, according to me, because because your brain is creating a model of the world, yeah, which you use to talk to me used to sit in your chair, used to do everything you do, and it's happening in REM sleep in extenso. Are, dream, are dreams those models? Dreams are the subjective experience of those models. And so dreams could be, could be thought to be, in, in and of themselves, physiologically significant physiologically informative. And that's one of, the, one of the things that I'm trying to do with my own self-study 
mm -hmm. and so far not not very good but yeah and i i think that what what your your uh, listeners should aware, be aware of is that their dreaming is not nonsensical it is sensical in a very unexpected way and that rem sleep, what rem sleep does is is create ties between remote associations and without a re remote association you and i wouldn't be having this discussion you're interested in the history all, all this stuff that already and i it's in my it's in my head and i i can tell you this so when i dream i suppose that a lot of those assumptions come out and get compared with what has happened during the daytime. If nothing, if there's no comparison, we don't do anything. But if there's a major comparison, we change our model. So that dream, that dream you had last night of the um, deaffrontation of the hand. Yeah. yeah. How how is that a, a, a model of? you know, the, the world that you're going to be experiencing the next day. Or my body image, my body image is a very important part of my conscious experience. And now, right now, I just, I just pick at this little thing on my, on my, on the back of my hand. But last night it becomes a sort of brain in itself. So, uh, you know, I don't know what that means, but it seems to me that uh, the, the back of my hand is a stand in, for the auto-creative nature of my brain. And the auto-creative nature of my brain is, in addition, uh, very somatic. There is no question that your body image is a, a part of what is being uh, re reinstantiated during your sleep. And this goes all the way back to Helmholtz. And that's why Helmholtz is such an important hero for me, for Carl Friston, and I am for you, uh, uh, and not even but, mentioned in Sigmund Freud's. Uh, I know, which is a crime. But I, I, I think Charles a crime, but it, it it shows how narrow his yeah, and that was an extremely extensive uh, work, chapter one of yeah, that chapter. review in chapter one was pretty damn extensive, and yet. It missed it. Missed go, didn't go back to the pact against vitalism, and that's yeah. that's what we're yeah. that's what we're talking about still. Of course, I think you you underappreciate Charles Sanders Peirce, because he he was just as much onto the Helmholtz stuff as Helmholtz himself. I, I agree. And thermodynamics and half a dozen other things. He, I mean, and he's an American genius. We always look to the Europeans, but. You know, we're no slouches over here, too. You know, well, so. thank you. Uh, go ahead and promote Pierce for all for all for all he's worth. I agree. I, with I, I, I shall. I yeah. shall. He's he's really an underappreciated genius in in so many ways. Um, I'll try to make him one of my heroes too. Then. Yay! All right. <laughs> All right, over to you, Michelle. Can I ask, what do you think is the, the role of the actual body in this, in this process? Because you talk a lot about the brain and the body image in the brain, but what do you think about actual bodily sensations and, and eye movements? What, what do you think they're contributing to, to this process of dreaming? And of I haven't sleep? thought a lot about it, but off the top of my head, I would tend to be skeptical about... Uh, the reality of, I think the body is offline in REM sleep, although uh, the model is not offline. The model, the, the model is a sensory motor model. The model that uh, Helmholtz uh, conveys to us is is very bodily. So again, uh, to answer your question, I would say that I think body image is crucial body itself i'm not convinced so what do you think I, about picking like eye movements. what what do you think about eye movements i think eye movements are efferent copy motor commands mm -hmm. and they, they they are essential to uh perception in waking mm -hmm. and they are essential to perception in dreaming 
but that doesn't mean that the eye movements themselves are of relevance to uh, uh, feelings about the body. I think what is remarkable about, about eye movement is that it is insensible. <laughs> the system has to have eye movement in order to function properly, but it doesn't need to know anything. It doesn't need to know anything about the reality of eye movement, in other words. Because as Helmholtz uh, suggested, and I think he was right, uh, in order for the perceptual apparatus to uh, maintain something like uh, perceptual uh, vi visibility of the vi vi visual scene, uh, the, 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 uh, the brain has to be really fooled. It has to be, it has to be, be led to believe that nothing has changed whereas something has changed very dramatically. In other words, I think that uh, rapid eye movements in waking and in REM sleep are efferent copy commands of motor system commands. And we are totally unaware of them. I mean, do you, are you aware of eye movement now? No, 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 neither am I, not at all. It's interesting that um, people who are paralyzed, you yes. know, nevertheless dream of themselves as fully embodied and perfectly they're functional. Their they're, they're, they're central uh, model of themselves is unimpaired. Yeah. What is, what is impaired is their, uh, the realization of those functions because there is interruption of the, the nervous system flow from mm -hmm. the brain to, to those body parts. And, uh, this has been shown by numerous people now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very exciting finding and one that should be made more of. I'm sorry, Michelle, I interrupted you. I just- No, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I hear you, that's, that's related to, so, I mean, that's still related to your idea that this model is something that we kind of have intrinsically, right? From, yes. yes. from when we're developing in the womb. And it's a model of, it's a model of how we can be and exist in the world, right? Of course. Is that the proto-consciousness that you talk about? Well, yes. I, I, proto-consciousness is, is meant to convey um, a kind of primitive state of consciousness, which is not to say we don't have it. We do. We are proto-conscious even now. Mm -hmm. But we are nothing but proto-conscious. Uh, well, <laughs> in the womb. Mm -hmm. So, so proto, what I say, the word proto means to, to me is elemental and preliminary and uh, primordial. And uh, it is a building stone or block of, of consciousness. And uh, without it, nothing. And why would we need to continue to return to that state throughout life after we develop this secondary consciousness? Because inputs uh, are often surprising and new things happen, like, like this podcast happens. You, you'll build this into your consciousness somehow. And hopefully people who watch it will build it into their consciousness too. And whether they remember their dreams or not. Mm -hmm. But they ha you, you have to constantly process new information. And that's not just a scientist. But you get married to somebody. You're in love with them. They're wonderful people. All of a sudden, they start hitting you in the face. Yeah. Okay. What happened? Update your, yeah. Something understand. happened. Yeah. So, so you have to change your, uh, your model of what men are all about. or You, know, you, you understand. I mean. Mm -hmm. That's a very mm -hmm. gross example, but it's yeah. a, a graphic one that I just saw. Um, Presumably, animals have proto-consciousness. Well, that's an interesting, that, 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 that gets into, that's in, in, uh, in uh, primary and secondary consciousness idea, which is to, but primary consciousness is proto-conscious. Proto-consciousness is a primary state of consciousness, and certainly, yes. Uh, mammals, at least, 
are capable of having that and do probably do have that. And that's why we love our pets so much because they do have yeah. primary or proto consciousness. Well, we make the mistake of assuming they have secondary consciousness. <laughs> we talk to them. I don't know. My cat, my cat has secondary. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, you know, but they, you you're not alone in thinking that. <laughs> it is not surprising that you think that. Because they have enough uh, primary consciousness to fool you. But again, yeah. I, I wouldn't expect the cat to go on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you ought to take the cat on the pod, podcast with you. The cat w- dreams. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're we're running short on time here, and I wanted to make sure we talked about some current theories of dreams. Go get ahead. your get your take on current theories, like for example, the continuity theory. What's your take on continuity theory? Well, it's, it's ob- you know obviously true. There is continuity between waking and and dreaming. It's, it would be absurd if, if it weren't the case. They have a relationship to each other an important functional and causal relationship to each other. So I have no problem with uh, that idea. What I have a problem with is the extension of that idea to uh, other sorts, other areas of science, which I think it does not pertain. I think that, uh, of course, uh, there, there is continuity. What else is new? I mean, the, but there's the, a lot of discontinuity as well. Is that what you're there saying? There is a lot of. Yeah. There has to be discontinuity as well, and yeah. discontinuity is to me much more interesting because it requires that the system make some adjustment. Whereas if they're if it's just the same, nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Presumably, if I dream about my mother and my mother is behaving as if she were really my mother. I don't do anything to my model. Yeah. But if, if suddenly my, my mother starts, uh, I don't know, hitting me or, or something like that, I have to make some sort of adjustment. Was she really more aggressive than I thought she was, let's say? Like, Just, Michelle, like Michelle was saying, updating prior beliefs. Sure. Yep. Again. According to the Friston model, Friston Hobson example, model. The wife beating model. And the, uh, the <laughs> mother reader model. You see what I'm driving at. The point is, I think that it's important to say that I never said that dreaming was not meaningful. Yeah. What I said was that dreaming does not conceal meaning, it reveals meaning. And that is 180 degrees different from what mm-hmm. Freud said. Mm-hmm. So, again, what I'm saying is let's, let's do more of this, you know. Let's do more dream recording and more attend, more attend, pay more attention to what it's telling us because it is a, a very informative state of mind. What about the threat simulation theory? Well, I think that's also obviously true. I mean, there's nothing worse than imagining that you might be killed or attacked. And so you're constantly uh, working through various dialogues or, or, or instantiations of the notion of threat in, in your dreams. Now, does that really help you? I don't know. But it's, I, I, think, I, think, I, I believe that Ravonsu was completely correct in this idea. But that doesn't account for all dreams, obviously. Just and, a, and good, I, a, a portion of them. I think the, the, fit, the, the weakness of Ravonsu's arguments are that he, he's just not physiological. Metzinger is a little bit more physiological. Mm-hmm. The philosopher? He's yeah. a German. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Leidman. Like, yeah. Like the, yeah. yeah. You can't get a PhD in, in uh, cognitive yeah. science in Germany today without knowing some physiology. Some physiology, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he knows a lot of physiology. Yeah. I, I like the, how he incorporates um, data from neuroscience, from neuropsychology in particular, yes. to his uh, theory, right. th- theory of the self. Yeah. The guy is a, is a, he's a major, major figure in our field. Yeah. 
And I don't think that most people who study dream, dreams have any idea who Thomas Metzinger is even. How about Jennifer Wendt's work? You know her work? Yes, I'm less enthusiastic about that because in her wonderful book, she devotes 300 pages to basically to Malcolm because Malcolm was a phys- philosopher. And that's, that's, that's the argument I have with you too. The philosopher, <laughs> um, in and of themselves, can make horrendous mistakes. And then they can talk, talk a good game, and take 300 pages of, of Wint's book to, yeah, well, that stuff has been dead for 50 years. Seems for, for, for us scientists, it's been dead. But for the philosophers, unfortunately, mm. they're still debating that goddamn stuff. They still think that there's something to it, you know? And yeah. so Jennifer Wint had to d- completely right. demolish those arguments. Well, that's why I say to settle that debate once and for all in philosophy of mind, so philosophy of mind could move forward. And I think she's she's done that. Yeah, I like her a lot. She's a wonderful person, and she was a student of Thomas Metzinger Mm -hmm. and uh, talked to me quite a bit about it. So the book is uh, the book is uh, is is, uh, admirable, but uh, you know it's uh, heavy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. What other theories, Michelle, should we ask Alan about? Um, probably emotion processing. What do you think? About oh, yeah, that? yeah, of course. Adapt- of, course adaptation of course, that's going on all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think, you know, my dreams are extremely emotional and they integrate my cognitive perceptual awareness with my uh, affective state. Definitely true. And so uh, I, I've always said that. I mean, I think, I think people, people responded to my initial dream theory as if I was against mm-hmm. uh, emotion. I was never against emotion. I just didn't know how to deal with it. Now I know a lot more how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Because we've, uh, we've described the, the activation of the temporal lobe and all that PGO wave stuff. This is just fabulous, and that all that all fits in into the uh, Hobson Friston model as well. And so this paper that I mentioned to you, uh, minds, brains, and some and psychiatry, mind, brains, and psychiatry, is is very relevant. The uh, the work of Charles Hahn um, uh, on the PGO system in humans. Mm. Is a big advance, a huge advance, and that that enable that also enables us to imagine proceeding in a detailed cellular neurophysiological way without doing animal experiments. We can now do them in humans. How is he measuring PGO waves in in humans? Uh, well, he records. Uh, let's see, he averages brain activity. Uh, using imagery. Mm-hmm. If you image frequently enough, you can see the activation of various neuronal systems. Mm-hmm. And he, he's done that very well. And th- those papers are impossible to read because he's a Korean. But uh, uh-huh. I think in mind, brains, and psychiatry, you'll see it all. Okay. Very because I put him in touch with Kristen and uh, Kristen helped him out a lot. And, I mean, he was working on his own, the poor guy, Charles Hong, comes from uh, South Korea, wants to work in my lab, can't get a visa. Yeah. This is another historical fact. Yeah. So he goes back to, to, to North Korea and gets himself trained to be a psychiatrist so he can get a visa and go and work in San Diego. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, that shows you how, how yeah, hard it is. Dedicated, yeah. You know, well, he, and he's still, he's still writing to me, and he, he still makes sense. Nice. So, again, you know, that, 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 that's another answer to the question of how you get students who are going to pursue these interesting ideas. <laughs> Recruit them from Korea, deny them a visa, Send them back to <laughs> that's, that's a complicated way. 
<laughs> Who's going to do this? Uh, Alan, do you think um, dream images are necessary for uh, incorporation of memories or for um, encoding? Well, I, think, I think a dreaming is essential. To, to, it it re restores memory. I mean, this, this, this lesion on my hand that becomes a brain is part of, is part of my memory. No question mm -hmm. about it. And uh, my memory is, uh, is, is poor, it's failing, but it's still pretty good. And, uh, how better, than, be? better than mine. How can, <laughs> I don't know about that, but it's probably longer than yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any dream theories out there now, Alan, that you think are just uh, a total waste of time or? Almost know? all of them. <laughs> 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 yes, I do. I really do. I mean, that sounds derogatory, and I don't mean that. But uh, most theories are wrong, including mine. Okay? <laughs> no, you, of course. Are you still working on a new theory? Well, I think I'm always working on a theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's new. What's new this morning is the, the realization that I mentioned earlier that the, uh, um, the Friston uh, attempt to mathematize and physicized uh, awareness, sensation, is mm -hmm. not sufficiently integrated with the dream theories. And I, I, I think it could, it, it, we could do more on that. But I've already said that. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'll do today, maybe, yeah. with what's left of my mind. <laughs> yeah. One thing I really liked about one of your papers with Friston is that you had an epilogue at the end where you just, you had kind of conversation. I, well, I insisted on that, you see. Yeah. Because I don't think that people understand how much the authors really talk to each other mm -hmm. and or disagree about certain things. And so I insisted that that be published. And uh, yeah, Friston is extremely uh, agreeable. He's amazingly, uh, he doesn't say, oh no, we can't do that for the following reasons. He, he says, okay, let's do it. I thought it was great. I think it would be great to see that in all theoretical more often. Yeah, yeah, more often. Plus, I think the papers that are published should include the referees' reports. Ah. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea, yeah. Peer That's review that. seems to be broken in so many ways, but that, could help, that could help fix it. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. No, I think that the journals uh, that were really forwardly forward-thinking would get away from this idea that the, the reviewers' uh, names have to be kept secret. I think that's, that's a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would have two uh, beneficial effects. One, it would enable the reader of the paper to understand a certain person's reservations. Mm -hmm. and two, it would eliminate the possibility or diminish the possibility that the reviewer is competitive with the author and shoots him down because he thinks he wants the grant funds. Yeah. If he says that the paper is good, he'll diminish his own chances of getting funding. Uh, I think it's time. That to would eliminate all that bullshit, yep. I don't think it would eliminate it, but it would reduce it. Reduce it at least, yeah. Well, I, I feel like we're running out of time. Um, Come back again.